Okay, for 9.30, if you want to start, we can start right now. We have already 176,079 people. Okay, good evening, and uh, thank you very much for having me to this collection of lectures that include uh, many different topics on uh, in varied areas of ophthalmology. I am a neuro-ophthalmologist, and as I considered what might be interesting uh, to this group, uh, recognizing that uh, modern imaging, and particularly, particularly uh, optical coherence tomography and its implications to the treatment and diagnosis of both optic neuritis and papilledema, which of course have nothing to do with each other, but in this context, uh, as neuro-ophthalmologists, we have come to uh, begin to incorporate these modalities uh, into our practice. Uh, I'll try to uh, share uh, some clinical vignettes and some clinical photos. We'll move uh, back and forth. We'll start on the optic neuritis topic uh, and then move to papilledema. I have uh, nothing relevant to uh, disclose to this uh, talk uh, beyond uh, an ownership in a company that makes uh, a visible light OCT, which I will not be talking about at all. So before I start, I would like to acknowledge uh, three colleagues. Uh, I could acknowledge hundreds of former trainees and learners. I'm a big believer in learning with the people I have taught uh, because they all teach me a lot. Uh, Steve Galetta, pictured in the middle there, and Laura Balser to his left with me, uh, really have been uh, thought leaders, uh, particularly on the topic of OCT and optic neuritis and multiple sclerosis. And my newest colleague, uh, Shira Simon, who's in our department at Northwestern, uh, has uh, slowly but surely uh, convinced me to become a pan-OCT user uh, as it relates to the neuro-ophthalmology practice, uh, reflecting a generational difference. Uh, so the first uh, patient I'll show won't be difficult to uh, think about or to uh, wonder what they may have, uh, is a patient, a woman who has two weeks of blurry vision with pain on eye movements. Uh, she describes a symptom called Oudhoff symptom, uh, those of you not familiar with that term, it's worsening of a neurologic symptom and particularly vision in the setting of elevation of temperature, exercise, for instance, or a hot shower. Uh, she recognizes that things look washed out and grays don't look the same against whites and a loss of color vision, and also um, denies any past neurologic history uh, that's relevant. And uh, as is expected, uh, there are paucity of findings uh, although uh, one could wonder whether the right optic disc might be a little bit swollen. Most importantly, the absence of any other stigmata of intraocular inflammation or choroiditis uh, with a healthy looking retina and normal looking retinal blood vessels. And of course, um, her, her presentation is highlighted by this bright signal seen in the optic nerve on the right uh, here with the arrow, along with a preview of a white matter lesion seen here on the flare images uh, of this MRI scan. Uh, here are some additional uh, flare images uh, highlighting these periventricular white matter lesions and, and the classic Dawson's figures, uh, fingers, which you'll see uh, described in the classically in multiple sclerosis patients. Uh, here's a second patient just with a, a series of different findings highlighted. This patient complaining of acute subacute vision loss in the left eye with pain on eye movements. Uh, this is just a two-photo snapshot uh, of a pen light demonstrating a left afferent pupillary defect. Almost all patients with optic neuritis will have an a, a, a asymmetry and therefore a left afferent pupillary defect is present. Uh, the only exception to this, of course, which we'll talk a bit about in a minute, are the patients that have had this before or have subclinical diseases. Remember, uh, especially with Goldman perimetry, a little bit harder with computerized perimetry, Central scotomas are very common in patients with optic neuritis. Turns out with computerized perimetry, diffuse, diffuse loss of visual field is actually the most common. When we're fortunate, we will often uh, demonstrate typical optic nerve enhancement. This is the first important point I'll make in that in the imaging arena, in the setting of a, an acute vision loss patients with optic neuritis, in whom you have access to uh, high quality, fat suppressed, gadolinium enhanced MRI scan, if you don't see an element in op of optic nerve abnormality, uh, then you should certainly consider an alternative diagnosis. And this patient also had uh, some white matter lesions. 
I'll stop for just a pause for a second here uh, and just remind you of things that aren't idiopathic optic neuritis or not in the differential diagnosis of optic neuritis. This would be the classic entity of neuroretinitis. This seen acutely with lots of disc swelling. Notice the presence of some hemorrhages. Hemorrhages would be exceedingly unusual in either idiopathic optic neuritis or the optic neuritis associated with neuromyelitis optica or uh, the anti-MOG syndrome. Uh, you also have a sense here of a turbid appearance to the macula with some subretinal fluid. And in the resolution phase, the typical neuroretinitis or star formation. This is typically seen uh, with cat scratch or other infectious um, uh, optic neuropathies. Here are some other examples. This is the case I just showed below uh, in which uh, compared to the top here, which is about the most swollen I've ever seen an optic nerve be with idiopathic optic neuritis. Notice no hemorrhages, no cotton roll spots. The findings here are subretinal granulopathy with lots of exudates from a chronically swollen disc. So in general, there'll be a paucity of findings on the uh, optic neuritis. Uh, on the um, fundus exam. And then remember that MRI scanning should generally reveal a more around the optic nerve, a sinusoid. Generally, we're going to think about the anti-MOG group of patients, which I will uh, describe in just a minute, and or perineuritis, which can sometimes accompany an idiopathic orbital inflammation like an orbital pseudotumor. So our initial facilitated by Neuroophthalmology's first uh, randomized clinical trial, which was done in the late 1980s and early 1990s. It was called the Optic Neuritis Treatment Trial. And its primary goal, and therefore the only thing we could draw conclusions about from that trial, was whether intravenous steroids versus oral steroids versus nothing offered any benefit to patients with optic neuritis. Turns out there's lots of uh, additional information that came from that study and mostly under, uh, helping us understand the relationship with multiple sclerosis uh, and what else might be happening in patients with um, optic neuritis. Uh, so some of the initial findings were that the only negative predictor of outcome is initial visual acuity. So if you start out worse than 2400, you're much less likely to recover to 2040. It's still pretty likely in the 85% range but it's only the 2100 and above that you can really predict have a better than 90% chance of getting back to 2020 vision. Um, probably one of the more important uh, findings, or at least the more relevant to a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, was the high prevalence of significant fellow eye abnormalities in patients with optic neuritis, suggesting that this disease exists in subclinical or occult forms without obvious previous history of optic neuritis. One of the more important clinical pearls to come from this study was that any indication of an atypical time course, and what I mean by that is almost 100% of patients who have idiopathic optic neuritis, this is not NMO, not MOG, not neuroretinitis, the, the typical demyelinating, demyelinating optic neuritis, if they're not at least a little bit better by the third week, then you should consider an alternative diagnosis. So if you're seeing your optic neuritis patient back and they were, even if they were hand motions to start, they should be 2,400 account fingers. Uh, they may not be back to normal, but some degree of improvement must be present uh, by the third or fourth week. And atypical of fundus appearance, again, hemorrhages, exudates, and other things uh, should be considered. Uh, the different disease in children uh, might have been our first indications, as we've always known about pediatric optic neuritis, uh, to acknowledge the high prevalence of the anti-MOG a subgroup in this group. Um, <clears throat> just some historical photos of relevance. Uh, von Grafe and Nettleship were the first to describe uh, optic neuritis as early as the late 19th century, uh, and there was the optic neuritis treatment troop who gathered. Other findings, uh, of course, the salient one is that IV steroids clearly hasten the recovery, although did not change the ultimate outcome. So I personally treat most of my patients with uh, steroids because of the availability of both infusion centers and the ability to give um, steroids intravenously at home, uh, at least uh, in the area that I practice. Uh, but the main reason to do 
it is to speed recovery. And in my mind, a speedy recovery is a happier patient and perhaps, although not shown in the trial, a patient less likely uh, to have permanent loss of neurons and axons. Um, a somewhat controversial finding, which has never been adequately explained, is the increased rate of recurrence in patients treated with conventional doses of steroids. This would be like a milligram per kilogram of prednisolone. Uh, these patients definitely had an increased rate of recurrence, although did not have an increased rate of developing multiple sclerosis. It's been questioned, but uh, we generally avoid this. However, we don't have to avoid it in the very high versions of oral steroids, and that would um, be equivalent to a gram of solumedrol a day. So we occasionally do use oral at high dose in patients who can't uh, develop get infusions. Uh, as I mentioned, the prognosis for recovery by the third week uh, any patient who was in the trial who was a man who had severe disc swelling with heme, hemorrhages around the disc, no pain and poor vision. Now, of course, these patients never developed multiple sclerosis because he probably did not have multiple sclerosis to start. As has classically been the teaching, about two-thirds have a normal appearing fundus, um, and uh, about 90% uh, ended up at 20-25 or better at uh, five years. Um, by uh, 10 years, 22% uh, um, risk of developing MS, even in the absence of brain lesions, 38% risk of multiple sclerosis overall. Uh, but uh, as far out as the 15th year, even a single uh, lesion predicts a high risk of developing multiple sclerosis that's probably on the order of 75%. So these diseases are inextricably linked. Um, <clears throat> there were only two misdiagnoses. It turned out, and this is sort of uh, a little bit different now about whether we should be testing our patients. Certainly in the routine test, in the routine patient who has either retrobulbar or a minimally swollen optic nerve, generally, uh, certainly sarcoid and syphilis are unlikely. Uh, and I am still waiting for my first patient in which ordering an ANA was relevant to the management of their neuroophthalmic problem. Um, color vision loss was nonspecific. Uh, and again, a very early but important finding that has really changed our thinking in patients with optic neuritis was the recognition that not visual acuity or visual fields, but contrast sensitivity and low letter contrast uh, acuity are by far the most sensitive indicator of optic neuritis uh, and its uh, relevant deficits. So, you know, that was when we thought about um, these two groups of patients and the top here, idiopathic, which most of the time turns out to be multiple sclerosis. That's the typical demyelinating optic neuritis that we see in the context of central nervous system demyelination. In the last decade, uh, we have come to appreciate an important um, subgroup of patients who present and can be phenotypically difficult to distinguish from optic neuritis ordinaire or idiopathic, and those are the patients with neuromyelitis optica. Some of you may remember this as Devix disease, uh, as it was identified in um, the years prior to establishing the actual antibody that is uh, responsible uh, for causing an auto autoimmune astrocytopathy. So this is uh, actually against astrocytes. Um, and then uh, the myelin, uh, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, or MOG, or anti-MOG associated optic neuritis. Uh, is also a recently described entity in the last decade. As it turns out, um, if you look at studies, both in retrospect and prospectively, in patients presenting with acute optic neuropathy, uh, these antibodies can be found in a small but significant subset of patients uh, on the order of uh, two to 5%. Uh, and then most notably, particularly in the pediatric age group, the high prevalence of MOG-associated optic neuritis um, this has led most of us to recommend, except in the most, a, in the most typical uh, patients, that everyone be tested uh, for NMO and sometimes MOG uh, based on their presentation. Again, uh, the, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but certainly if it's bilateral and severe vision loss and or vision loss that's not recovering, NMO must go way up your list as opposed to idiopathic and multiple sclerosis. Um, John Chen from the Mayo Clinic has really led neuroophthalmology in much of our thinking about uh, these entities, uh, particularly because of his access to uh, so many of the patients that are tested and um, so many of the patients uh, that have serum stored uh, 
Uh, this was a study uh, in which uh, they went back, uh, the top one, that's, that doesn't go with this chart, this top one, and actually tested the serum of patients in the optic neuritis treatment trial and found no patients who had NMO and only a couple that had the MOG antibody would suggest that the clinical acumen of the doctors who enrolled patients in the trial was sufficient to identify this condition. Um, this is another study that was just published in JAMA Neurology in the last several months, uh, looking at the prevalence of these antibodies and sort of where I got these numbers. Suffice it to say that in patients with acute central nervous system dysfunction, in which people were thinking of multiple sclerosis, NMO and MOG, there is a small but significant prevalence of these entities. So uh, depending on which part of the world you're in, and particularly true in Asia, uh, NMO uh, needs to be uh, much higher on your list and tested for in any atypical situations. Obviously, when the clinical course isn't right or the fundus exam isn't right, then we're going to think about inflammatory, infectious, and infiltrative optic neuropathies that work their way into the differential diagnosis. Here's uh, John Chen, uh, another great article for uh, anyone who's interested uh, writing about um, the phenotypic versus the biomarker uh, prevalence of these diseases. Uh, generally, and I think these tables are accurate, so I will go through them just briefly. Uh, every patient who has an acute optic neuritis should have an MRI scan of the orbit and uh, ideally the brain to look for other white matter lesions. The testing for the NMO or aquaporin-4 immunoglobulin or the MOG immunoglobulin should be considered and executed in all patients with atypical optic neuritis. As I mentioned, severe vision loss, bilateral vision loss, poor vision recovery, a very swollen optic nerve. The nerve sheath enhancement that I pointed out earlier, perineuritis, which is common with the MOG, uh, and uh, other uh, findings on MRI scan um, would all be indications for this. And then, of course, the other workup as uh, has out been outlined above for uh, other uh, patients with uh, different inflammatory optic neuropathies. So we're at the point now where we're back to recommending uh, IV steroids for most patients uh, who present with acute optic neuropathies. Uh, once we're on the NMO uh, train, so to speak, uh, then <clears throat> plasma exchange uh, becomes uh, an important and relevant treatment. And then as we'll talk about uh, various antibody, anti-human uh, antibody treatments have shown to be very effective uh, for NMO patients. And again, with uh, MOG, uh, once again, we're IV steroids, uh, prednisone taper, and plasma exchange uh, if you uh, have that diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> I like uh, this rule of uh, Steve Galetta's, which he very, very eloquently outlined in his recent Jacobson lecture at Nanos. Uh, about patients with MOG. This is a good way of thinking about it. Here's an MRI scan that's showing uh, the typical uh, perineural uh, enhancement of the optic nerve sheath. About 50% of the time, it's recurrent. 50% of the time, there's bilateral. 50% of the time, there's severe disc edema. 50% of the time, you have the perineuritis. And about 50% of the time, it's a simple monophasic illness. For NMO, again, the classic presentation when I trained, uh, these were patients who were all uh, essentially blind uh, and wheelchair bound because of a myelopathy and severe bilateral optic neuritis uh, associated with the extensive uh, myelitis. Uh, and now, at least in the immunocompetent patient, both the blood and CSF can be tested uh, for the NMO antibody. Why should you try to diagnose NMO whenever you suspect it? Um, several reasons. Uh, one is this is a devastating disease which now has effective treatment, uh, so a high prevalence of blindness and or being wheelchair or needing a cane to be assisted. Um, there is a subset of patients that follow a benign course, but up to 55% will have a high risk of recurrent disease. Uh, and again, there may be a disconnect between the CSF and the blood. So we want to work hard to make this diagnosis any patient uh, that has a suspicious presentation. Here would be the typical uh, findings. Uh, one, of course, is the extensive longitudinal lesions uh, in the spinal cord, typical of neuromyelitis. Uh, and then there's an unusual presentation in the dorsal uh, medulla area postrema with positive signal abnormality there that is uh, typical of um, NMO. Again, depending on uh, where you practice uh, in patients that have had bariatric surgery and or have other reasons to be 
nutritionally depleted. A very similar illness to NMO can be mimicked by a severe B12 or copper deficiency. Again, for the treatment of acute NMO, uh, IV methylprednisolone, plasmapheresis, and gamma globulin going after the antibody uh, to save um, the autoimmune effect is important. Antibodies are now becoming the mainstay of treatment uh, uh, for uh, NMO and MOG for sure, and multiple sclerosis on the way. These are very expensive, uh, but particularly the recent studies of ecolizumab uh, and, uh, as an NMO complement inhibitor have shown very striking and successful results uh, in addition to uh, these other antibodies, uh, which have also been shown to be effective. In fact, rituxan is very effective as well in treating these patients. We've also learned that OCT might be an effective way of it helping to identify the phenotype, which is um, the NMO phenotype. And that is, uh, if you look down here at the uh, uh, picture, it's a little bit hard to see, at least on my computer, but once the nerve fiber layer gets down to 60 or less nerve fiber uh, micron thickness, uh, that is very unlikely to be a typical recovered idiopathic optic neuritis. And when you get that thin, uh, most likely to be NMO and MOG and more likely than the uh, idiopathic. And um, these numbers, the 60 to 80, uh, keep them in mind because uh, lots of us believe that that's around the threshold at which point patients will have severe disability from axonal loss in the setting of uh, inflammatory optic neuropathies. Here's a, another summary. Uh, I think, yes, this is uh, from the, the John Chen paper, uh, pointing out the differences between the idiopathic and multiple sclerosis associated optic neuritis, uh, the aquaporin 4 optic neuritis, and the anti MOG. Uh, you can see that it's not helpful in terms of age group. These are all young adults, uh, slightly more prevalent in. Um, uh, women than men, and uh, most of these, because they are inflammations of the optic nerve, are in fact associated with pain. Uh, very rarely uh, are uh, the the typical optic neuritis patient has active optic neuritis in both eyes at the same time. Although again, we'll see soon that subclinical disease is common, whereas NMO and MOG are very common to prevent in uh, both eyes at the same time. Worse vision, again, back to that severe vision loss favors these other entities, uh, and um, uh, you can uh, see that the clinical and the temporal pattern uh, is very different. The MOG patient may become steroid dependent, and uh, the NMO patient has uh, the worse uh, prognosis. Um, <clears throat> I'll take you down here to the MRI findings in optic neuritis. This is, would be a typical uh, optic neuritis patient with a little bit of disc swelling and some enhancement of the optic nerve. Uh, here is a patient with the normal fundus and NMO with the typical spinal cord lesion, and you can see uh, a lesion that extends all the way back and is involving the perichiasmatic optic nerve. Uh, and then the typical MOG patient with a very diffusely bilateral swollen optic nerve, some sense of optic nerve sheath <coughs> enhancement, <clears throat> and then a deep uh, gray matter and diffuse brainstem, multifocal white matter lesions, these big patchy confluent areas uh, that would not be typical of uh, demyelinating optic neuritis. So this is a handy table in that article by Chen in the Survey of Ophthalmology is one you should refer to. Uh, here's a nice summary table that my colleague, Dr. Simon, uh, put together in terms of how we think about these. Remember that um, one of the uh, difficult and tricky parts about NMO is that it does probably exist on a spectrum. and Not every patient is going to present with positive antibodies and an ability uh, to detect it uh, in the serum and or spinal fluid. So you have to consider this uh, in your differential diagnosis of patients with optic neuritis. Um, <clears throat> remember that uh, these titers can be detected uh, in the spinal fluid, um, more significant disc edema, steroid dependent, a better prognosis than NMO for anti-MOG. And again, if uh, recurrent, uh, then uh, more uh, of the antibody treatments are going to come into play. So um, we have uh, certainly expanded our thinking concerning these two alternate forms of optic neuritis uh, in the last five to seven years. I'm going to shift gears a little bit now and um, point out just a couple of uh, interesting things. Um, this is an absolutely classic paper from, I guess we're now 36 years ago, 56 years ago, 
46 years ago, I got it right, 46 years ago, uh, written by um, <clears throat> none other than uh, Bill Hoyt and Lars Prezen, whose name will come up in a minute again, recognizing that um, there was uh, as uh, ophthalmoscopically visible loss of nerve fiber layer or axons in patients with multiple sclerosis. This is absent optic neuritis. Then I'll point out, <clears throat> as I alluded to earlier, that the optic neuritis treatment trial clearly showed significant prevalence of other eye abnormalities in patients with optic neuritis. And this is the other eye that was not necessarily symptomatic. So is something happening at the same time at a subclinical level uh, in patients with acute optic neuritis? Uh, and here's a uh, 2010 brain article demonstrating retinal ganglion cell and ganglion cell axon atrophy in patients with multiple sclerosis. So clearly, um, something is happening in the background, and something has, has the capability um, <clears throat> to be able to uh, help us identify these patients uh, and uh, move forward in the differential diagnosis of what may actually be happening to the anterior visual pathway of patients with multiple sclerosis. Then I'll show you this <clears throat> case of Steve Galetta's, which uh, clearly has a uh, history because the patient had had uh, sim something similar many years ago of pain and eye movements, but absolutely no visual symptoms and no visual deficits detected on acuity or visual field color testing or low contrast acuity. And then when you look at these discs, you'd say, well, maybe it's a little bit swollen. And sure enough, the OCT confirms on the right side some thickening uh, of uh, the nerve fiber layer uh, in this patient's right eye. With this in mind, uh, a very early diagnosis of mild optic neuritis was made. Um, <clears throat> OCT even made it to the Wall Street Journal uh, when uh, early eye exams detect early signs of multiple sclerosis. Uh, this was kind of prescient to recognize that uh, in the mid-2000s, uh, in the time um, of uh, time domain OCT, even the detection of optic nerve uh, thinning of the nerve fiber layer was sufficient to suggest that we had a test that might be identifying multiple sclerosis. So where is OCT in terms of the value of managing patients with, um, um, in, with multiple sclerosis? Of course, uh, the recognition of disc swelling and then the lo subsequent loss of nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell layer, uh, very important uh, as <clears throat> the detection of nerve fiber layer swelling uh, may, uh, be, um, in, may occur in patients who are asymptomatic and be indicative of disease. The ophthalmologist knows, of course, that uh, OCT has essentially eliminated the category of uh, diseases that we used to call occult maculopathies, which were occasionally confused with uh, optic neuritis. Uh, so OCT always helpful in the differential diagnosis of central vision loss. Obviously, the more severe <clears throat> nerve fiber layer thinning that I alluded to uh, in patients with uh, NMO. <clears throat> and then uh, we're still, you know, it's 15 years later, and we're still trying to get the optic nerve recognized as a critical element in our understanding of disease progression in optic neuritis. Uh, this is a, a study that was reported by Laura Balser in 2007 in the natalizumab uh, treatment trial for multiple sclerosis. And uh, while high contrast acuity showed nothing, when she introduced testing with a low contrast letter acuity, she was able to see a significant difference between placebo and natalizumab in terms of the protective effect. This was our first indication that we had something that correlated with our optic neuritis patients who were clearly telling us that they didn't see well as they used to see, uh, even though we tested their visual acuity and their visual fields were normal. Around the same time, uh, a medical student working with me, Jen Fisher, um, <clears throat> looked back at a series of patients with multiple sclerosis, uh, and we thought that uh, this would very clearly and easily show and demonstrate what we thought we saw ophthalmoscopically uh, with um, uh, uh, nerve fiber layer thinning leading to optic nerve atrophy, a significant difference between controls and MSIs. What we had not recognized <clears throat> and what we stepped on was something that turned out to be critically important in our understanding of the disease, and that was that in patients with just a multiple sclerosis with no history of optic neuritis, a very significant difference uh, in nerve fiber layer thickness uh, 
absent any history of multiple sclerosis of optic neuritis. And here's the actual table from that chart uh, demonstrating a consistent uh, group of MS non-optic neuritis eyes that clearly demonstrated uh, thinning of the nerve fiber layer as an indication that these axons were being affected absent episodes of optic neuritis. Anthony, Dan <coughs> Anthony Daniels, who's <coughs> another medical student working with us, was able to uh, correlate this with quality of life in patients with multiple sclerosis. So that was capturing what they were describing as my vision's not right. Uh, and the same thing has been subsequently shown with the ganglion cell and interflexiform layer measurements, which turn out to be even more sensitive in predicting low contrast level acuity vision loss, and as well, um, lo loss of quality of life in association with it. A little bit earlier, I alluded to uh, that 75-ish micron thickness as a critical point for us to be thinking about in identifying patients with vision disability. Fiona Costello reported uh, this uh, very eloquently done study, uh, which identified and looked simply at the visual field mean deviation versus the nerve fiber layer thickness. And you can see that at about 75 and up, everybody was still uh, showing minimal detected mean deviation on Humphrey visual field. As soon as you cross that threshold, however, there was a good correlation to visual field loss with thinning of the nerve fiber. Uh, and this, I think, is going to become an important way in which ophthalmologists play a role uh, in potentially assessing uh, visual function and treatments in multiple sclerosis. Again, other studies here showing a clear correlation uh, between change in nerve fiber layer thickness from baseline uh, and uh, following patients forward with multiple sclerosis, absent a history of optic neuritis. <clears throat> Low contrast acuity is associated with that nerve fiber layer thinning along with uh, ganglion cell volume loss, even in the absence of uh, op op episodes of optic neuritis. And all of these studies have effectively been repeated uh, in both uh, um, uh, have been repeated in patients with multiple sclerosis when the ganglion cell layer was added to the nerve fiber layer uh, with uh, enhanced uh, OCT uh, and showed very, very similar findings. One point I'd like to make uh, before we wrap up on optic neuritis, there's some question <clears throat> as to whether what we're seeing in these optic in these multiple sclerosis eyes represents a transsynaptic phenomena, which we generally believe does not occur in adults. So could this occur based on the white matter disease of the brain leading to a transsynaptic degeneration of axons because visual pathways in the brain were affected? That is not thought to be the case uh, uh, at this point based on various studies which suggest that this is truly ganglion cells uh, and their axons that are dying in the setting of multiple sclerosis. This is an example of true... Um, um, <clears throat> Uh, transsynaptic degeneration, which occurs uh, in um, patients who have who are young and develop a post ganglion uh, post geniculate lesion um, during um, a perinatal injury, which can uh, unfortunately lead to transsynaptic degeneration and loss of uh, ganglion cell axons. Uh, if there's a Nicholas Jimenez on the line, can you please stop trying to take control of the screen? Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so um, we don't have much new yet on treatment. Uh, this is an interesting study, which I think is a, a premonition of more to come that will be very important. This is the RENEW trial. This is another slide of uh, Steve Galetta's. Um, Lingo is a membrane glycoprotein uh, that actually a, is a natural suppressor of oligodendrocyte myelination. So if you could block Lingo, uh, maybe you can effectively treat patients with multiple sclerosis, allow it to remyelinate and nerves to survive sooner. Uh, so opacinumab is a um, antibody against lingo, which was tried in the RENEW trial. Uh, and uh, the trial uh, turned out to be negative on its primary endpoint. Uh, but this trial included patients that were not treated till the after the 21st day. Uh, so... <clears throat> One of Steve's questions uh, that he uh, asked us as a broader audience is, uh, can we, should we be trying this in a uh, earlier phase of the illness? Uh, and then the second thing they noticed was that there was a uh, significant um, 
trend towards a improvement in the VEP or visual evoke potential, which was the primary endpoint in this trial. Uh, and they were uh, suggesting that if perhaps they tested people even further down the road uh, after a fuller recovery could have happened, that they might have seen a, a treatment effect. So uh, look out for more uh, on uh, the anti-lingo antibodies. Uh, and a recent uh, publication by, again, uh, Stephen Lara's group uh, looked at some type of a threshold in terms of detecting patients who may have had uh, optic neuritis or a demyelinating event in the past as an indication of another uh, localization for uh, an demyelinating event. Uh, and this paper just recently published in the Journal of Neuroophthalmology basically took a bunch of healthy people and showed that anything more than a five micron difference between the two eyes uh, as a threshold based on this uh, receiver operator curve as maybe something they could apply to multiple sclerosis patients. So they identified the five or six millimeter threshold <clears throat> and then looked at patients who had had multiple sclerosis uh, and uh, felt that this was a significant threshold for identifying a previous optic nerve lesion in multiple sclerosis. So if you have patients in whom you're suspicious and or who you note other neurologic illness who have this amount of difference between the two eyes, only six micro. Uh, uh, microns, uh, that would be suspicious for optic neuritis. And finally, in terms of imaging of the optic nerve, uh, there's a new sequence in the last uh, three or four years uh, called the double inversion recovery MRI or DIR uh, recovery MRI scan. Uh, here's some examples. I just picked this one paper. There are several papers that I would uh, turn your attention to uh, because this is able to detect both symptomatic and asymptomatic disease. Uh, so we're not looking for subtle differences in comparing the two eyes. It's not dependent on asymmetry, as is OCT, uh, and it may be an important comp complement to OCT detection. Uh, and sure enough, in this uh, paper in Brain uh, in 2019, uh, the um, uh, recovery sequence was compared to OCT and turned out to be both uh, as a um, <clears throat> both were an excellent clinical window and put together uh, in detecting. Uh, patients who had had optic neuritis. So uh, both OCT and uh, these uh, newer MRI techniques uh, with uh, double inversion uh, are going to turn out to be uh, very important in the detection of ongoing demyelinating disease and previous uh, optic neuritis. So in summary, <clears throat> retinal nerve fiber layer is slightly thickened acutely in optic neuritis, and you can detect that with OCT. Um, there is a thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer, and generally, if it stays above 80 or 85, and certainly above uh, 90, then there generally won't be detectable visual field defects. We see this very prevalently in patients who have not had known optic neuritis, presumably as a primary manifestation of multiple sclerosis without optic neuritis, uh, with thinning of the non-optic neuritis MSIs. This thinning correlates with brain atrophy. This thinning, as uh, has been subsequently shown, of course, correlates with gangrene cell loss. Um, it is even thinner in primary progressive compared to relapsing and remitting multiple sclerosis. Uh, if your neurologic colleagues are looking for help in understanding how to classify their <clears throat> MS patients, and remember that uh, the nerve fiber layer and gangrene cell loss uh, is worse in NMO, um, but uh, may not distinguish these patients acutely. So our differential diagnosis will continue to be better understood as we learn more about the phenotypes of MOG and NMO. Uh, these are distinct <coughs> entities <coughs> with unique uh, treatments uh, and have to be identified by the presenting ophthalmologist uh, based on the atypical features. Imaging and OCT and MRI scan will help us understand uh, how common <coughs> and whether ongoing injury is occurring in patients' optic nerves who have multiple sclerosis. We believe that subclinical injury to the optic nerve, which can be detected by the ophthalmologist uh, or the astute uh, and well-equipped neurologist with OCT, uh, and that combination of OCT and low contrast letter acuity will be important outcomes in all trials for multiple sclerosis, and hopefully in trials that will someday uh, provide early repair of axons, neuroprotection, uh, and maybe gene therapy in patients with demyelinating disease. All right, I'm gonna switch gears now and um, uh, move to papilledema and its imaging. Uh, first, uh, uh, by way of de definition, 
Uh, papilledema is uh, the term we use to describe only disc swell to describe the disc swelling that results from elevated intracranial pressure. So we would never describe the swollen disc from optic neuritis as papilledema. Um, <clears throat> this is a disc swelling that results from axoplasmic stasis. Uh, as is seen in the bottom bullet here, the, the actual optic nerve sheath develops pressure in it. It squeezes on the axon and prevents axons from flowing. Um, axons from clearing their uh, materials uh, away from the ganglion cell body uh, and leading to this uh, swelling, which is not actually watery edema as we think about it in other inflammatory processes. It's generally bilateral, though can be asymmetric based on the width of the optic canal and potentially because of low uh, pressure in the eye. The papilledema could be worse on eyes with uh, low pressure. And as I'll talk extensively about there are lots of other patients who have pseudopapilledema and elevation of their optic nerve without nerve fiber layer edema and without elevated intracranial pressure. Now, here's an index case of Shira's of a young girl with a headache and neck pain, um, had some uh, mood changes recently, and uh, was uh, recognized to have good visual acuity, but argue with visual field defects and enlarged blind spots on uh, Goldman visual fields. And here are her discs, uh, which uh, clearly uh, show uh, marked disc swelling with lots of ischemic changes around the disc and a presentation given her intact visual acuity that would be uh, most consistent with acute papilledema. Um, <clears throat> there are some that believe that uh, being able to uh, categorize papilledema may be a little less necessary now that we have OCT in terms of measuring the absolute nerve fiber layer thickness. Uh, but Lars Frizen was the first to uh, ask uh, and apply a fairly standard uh, bunch of uh, criteria that uh, are used to identify patients uh, and characterize patients with papilledema. So when you hear people uh, calling them stages or grades, uh, this is the basis for it. Um, <clears throat> uh, there are a couple of interesting observations. You know, the stage five champagne cork chronic papilledema, uh, generally easy to recognize. Uh, stage one is this sort of C-shaped crescent where it's mostly elevation uh, of the nasal portion of the optic disc. Um, and then uh, stage two with the circumferential halo. I find the distinction between three and four uh, to be sometimes pretty dubious, particularly when there's lots of cotton wool spots. Uh, the main distinction here is whether the central vessels are obscured. So once the central vessels are obscured, it, it qualifies as stage four. Uh, but you could argue that this patient um, has only stage three papilledema based on the central vessels being spared, uh, but based on the prevalence of these ischemic changes around the disc, it's certainly very concerning uh, that uh, the patient's at risk for significant vision loss. So not everybody progresses through this. A one can go right to a four, but it's a useful uh, classification system uh, as we're uh, teaching about papilledema and making the observations. But back to our patient, uh, not surprisingly, there was a uh, massive thickening of the nerve fiber layer uh, present in both eyes. Uh, and uh, certainly in the era of OCT, we've come to appreciate uh, the number of patients that have fluid uh, tracking from their swollen discs uh, into the subretinal space. <clears throat> and this uh, a potential reason why some have uh, some mild central acuity loss. But most important is the um, uh, circumferential scan uh, that we now have become, and the linear scan, which have become important um, uh, in helping us uh, appreciate uh, some very important findings of papilledema, which I will uh, talk about a little bit more in a minute. But it's not hard just to look at this patient's OCT and realize that the, the globe is flattened and pushed forward. Uh, and in fact, uh, this observation of the bowing forward of Brooks membrane Right? If, if Brooks membrane had continued in a normal circumferential, circumferential fashion, uh, it would be back here. So the correlate to <clears throat> increase sheath pressure is this bowing forward of Brooks membrane, uh, which is one of the more reliable findings that you should try to identify in patients who have a, a swollen optic nerve and you're concerned about papilledema. Uh, so it's not actually this thickening and elevation, which can occur uh, in various uh, other causes of disc swelling and in pseudopapilledema, uh, but it's more this bowing forward that you should be looking for. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the things you want to ask about uh, in patients with typical presentations of papilledema, uh, 
The classic um, uh, is uh, transient visual obscurations. Pulsatile tinnitus is another important similar sympt uh, symptom that's present in almost all patients with elevated intracranial pressure. This is a pulse synchronous swishing sound that patients hear. And of course, the typical headache, which is uh, present in the prone position, uh, but sometimes not typically uh, described. We, uh, in patients in whom we are not certain about the diagnosis of papilledema, I'll talk about uh, these other modalities in their use in distinguishing it from uh, pseudopapilledema. And when we're on this journey to identify the cause of papilledema in a patient who may otherwise be completely asymptomatic and neurologically normal, MRI imaging, of course, is critical to rule out a tumor as well as an MRV to rule out a venous sinus thrombosis. Uh, and then uh, no patient uh, should be managed except in special circumstances without a lumbar puncture, uh, which demonstrates both the high opening pressure and normal uh, CFS, CSF constituents. MRI can be used uh, not only to detect tumors, but to find typical findings of uh, <clears throat> elevated intracranial pressure. Uh, they're not all present on these two scans, but I'll point out uh, flattening of the pituitary gland or an empty cellar trajectory here. So uh, that's typical. Uh, this patient demonstrates a really nice example of posterior globe flattening. And you can actually see <clears throat> the swollen disc uh, protruding into the uh, vitreous. Uh, sometimes you can actually see distension of the optic nerve sheath. Uh, and if a sagittal section captures the optic nerve, uh, you can see vertical tortuosity of the optic nerve sheath on MRI scan. So for our patient, uh, once she passed her MRI scan, outside of those normal um, um, findings of elevated intracranial pressure, she underwent a lumbar puncture, uh, and uh, the manometer went over the top. It was greater than 55 centimeters of water, uh, and therefore she met the dandy criteria that are commonly referred to uh, as uh, diagnostic of idiopathic intracranial hypertension with a classic history, no neurologic findings, normal neuroimaging, and <clears throat> a high uh, CSF opening pressure. So these patients are managed with weight loss, which I'll uh, talk about in a minute. The uh, idiopathic uh, intracranial hypertension treatment trial clearly uh, demonstrated that large doses of Diamox are well tolerated and should be the primary treatment uh, for all patients uh, with. Uh, our <clears throat> with um, uh, patients uh, who have papilledema and vision loss. There's a small subset of patients who have no visual symptoms and normal visual function that can be managed just with weight loss. But in general, we're going to be using uh, large doses of Dimox, up to three or four grams a day, particularly in patients with vision loss of presentation, to monitor and to treat our to treat our patients with careful monitoring. Um, <clears throat> this particular patient, uh, because her uh, disc edema was on that 3-4 spectrum, it was 3 because the central vessels were spared. It was 4 in my world because of the presence of the cotton wool spots, which always make me nervous about early vision loss. Uh, and and the, this patient had to be watched very closely, uh, got quickly up to 3 grams uh, or even 4 grams of Dimox a day, uh, and to have repeat testing within a couple of weeks. Patient deteriorated symptomatically. Of the uh, significant nerve fiber layer thickening. And very importantly, I want to point out now that curvature to Brooks membrane is now pointing away from the vitreous in a concave fashion, as opposed to previously where it was pointing up uh, towards the vitreous in association with the bowing forward uh, um, flattening of the globe. Uh, once the shunt is placed, you can probably pretty quickly move off of Diamox over a few weeks, uh, and uh, the patient has to be followed carefully just to make sure the shunt is working and the uh, condition is resolved. There are other findings that we can detect on, uh, particularly with ONFOS OCT imaging and with ophthalmoscopy uh, that are typical in patients with papilledema, these radial choroidal folds, uh, it's always hard to say when you look at them ophthalmoscopically, whether they're retinal or choroidal. Uh, Pat Sibony has led the uh, review of the IHTT data uh, to look at this, and these turn out to be uh, radial choroidal folds. Uh, 
uh, and then the more typical Peyton's lines, which are the circumferential folds that we see next to the actively swollen disc in patients with uh, papilledema. <clears throat> so remember, we have to rule out brain tumors and uh, other risk factors like tetracycline, uh, and of course, uh, venous sinus thrombosis, which can mimic idiopathic intracranial hypertension to a T uh, and must be excluded in all patients. Uh, treatment is uh, as, uh, diamox and so, salt restriction, as well as body weight reduction. And uh, be very careful in patients whose discs look similar to the one I showed uh, in terms of their risk for subsequent vision loss. <clears throat> uh, there is still a role for optic nerve sheath fenestration. Here's two examples from uh, my practice and patients uh, who underwent optic nerve sheath fenestration uh, with prompt resolution of uh, disc swelling and restoration of normal visual fields. Uh, as a group, neuroophthalmologists attempted uh, to do the surgical IHTT trial or site trial, uh, looking at uh, <clears throat> medical therapy versus optic nerve sheath fenestration versus VP shunting. Um, this is for patients with moderate and severe vision loss. Unfortunately, there uh, was a very, very, very slow start in poor enrollment, uh, and this study has been uh, canceled and will not be performed. Uh, weight loss has had uh, several uh, interesting uh, studies to suggest that it clearly works. It certainly works uh, when coached with a nutritionist, and there have been several studies over the years, and there isn't a neuro-ophthalmologist who wouldn't uh, convincingly tell you that uh, just losing about 10% of your body weight almost certainly uh, has the potential to reverse this condition. Uh, several interesting twists, uh, Dr. Sugarman, this is uh, early studies that were done in the 90s uh, that actually looked at various devices that could take abdominal pressure uh, off, uh, and potentially uh, that was the mechanism by which weight loss would contribute to reversing of papilledema. It turns out that um, nobody really understands the, understands the exact connection uh, between uh, obesity and why patients develop idiopathic intracranial hypertension. It's not believed to be hormonal, and it does it is believed to be somehow related to uh, venous return. Uh, here's another a patient of uh, Shira's who's a 28-year-old man presenting with headaches and peripheral vision loss. Uh, and here's another uh, Volpeism. This is by definition not idiopathic intracranial hypertension in my world, because I always start with the premise that men do not get IIH, um, and certainly there are uh, many exceptions to that rule, but it's, you're pretty safe in assuming that if you're about to diagnose IIH in a man, that you're probably wrong, and that you should look for alternative diagnoses. One clue for him was that he had had a significant personality change uh, recently, and sure enough, he has a large uh, subfrontal um, <clears throat> turns out to be an, an oligodendroglial tumor, uh, but no symptoms except the personality change in papilledema for this uh, patient who was otherwise looking like a pseudotumor patient. Obviously, much more common than encountering uh, pseudotumor are going to be patients you encounter either with headaches and or from routine examinations who are detected to have optic nerves that look like this group on top, which are not hard to um, uh, which, which are hard to distinguish uh, from papilledema. Uh, each of these patients um, have different conditions. Uh, this patient, obviously, optic distrusion, and as demonstrated by the hyperreflectivity at the globe nerve junction seen on ultrasound. These patients with small, sort of hyperplastic, hyperopic nerves. Uh, this is a late phase fluorescent angiogram showing uh, no disc staining or leakage, which would not be compatible with papilledema or disc edema. Uh, these other examples are more obvious, of course, myelinated nerve fiber. Here's a patient with myelinated nerve fiber and clinically significant macular edema from diabetes, sort of mimicking chronic papilledema. Uh, and then when you're lucky, uh, either CAT scan, which detects calcification at the globe nerve junction, or obvious drusion ophthalmoscopically are the more predictable ways of detecting um, optic disc drusen. I'll put these uh, pictures forward again uh, from the previous slide. Um, maybe all of you would guess Drusen on these patients, although uh, there's some uh, confusion with a little bit of blurring of vessels. This comes up on a later teaching slide, but the presence of peripapillary subretinal hemorrhages is actually more common in pseudopapilledema than it is in true papilledema. But now I'll point out these discs on the bottom. Uh, which uh, are arguably ambiguous. I think all of these, if you had OCTs, would show uh, 
elevation uh, and or thickening of the nerve fiber layer. Uh, it turns out that these are, in fact, all examples of papilledema. And the reason I know that is because on a subsequent exam, uh, four weeks later, their appearance changed. Um, and um, they um, got worse in, in this particular case. Uh, these uh, particular patients I showed uh, the bottom one in backwards order. So this is where they started. And in a resolution phase, they got to this point. Uh, so um, I'll make this point again later on. But you know, in the absence of neurologic symptoms and in the setting of normal neuroimaging, it is perfectly reasonable to take careful photographs and OCT of your patient and simply see them back in a month. Um, and if they have full visual fields, you theoretically could skip the lumbar puncture. And uh, the reason I say that is because I think part of the reason that we've not been able to develop a gold standard uh, criteria on OCT photographs or anything else for the diagnosis and distinction of papilledema and pseudopapilledema is because there really isn't a gold standard of um, what is papilledema based on other diagnostic testing. So you can imagine there are lots of people that have pseudopapilledema and undergo a lumbar puncture that isn't done exactly right and have an opening pressure of 26. And therefore, the examiner concludes that that patient belongs in the papilledema category uh, when all along they never had papilledema, they just had pseudopapilledema. So we, ne we may never know exactly uh, what and how to distinguish these patients. Um, just because not having a gold standard for papilledema. And, and most of the time, quite frankly, it is not hard to diagnose and manage these patients with a combination of photography, OCT, maybe some unnecessary MRI scans, and a careful follow-up. Here are some uh, other examples. This is a patient of uh, Shira's. Uh, I think this disc, it's not going to be hard to point out uh, the optic disc drusen, but if you just had this disc, uh, you may not come to that conclusion. Uh, until you did fundus autofluorescence uh, and demonstrate a very obvious presence of optic distrusion. Uh, here's another patient. Uh, the giveaway here, of course, is the very abnormal vessel pattern. Remember, patients with optic distrusion and pseudopapilledema often have uh, early branching of their vessels or a more radial pattern for the branching vessels. Again, you'd be very suspicious of drusen that you can see ophthalmoscopically on these photos. Uh, and here, because they're probably, quote, more buried, a little bit harder to see, uh, but they certainly do appear uh, on fundus autofluorescence. There have been uh, several attempts to characterize, uh, particularly on enhanced depth imaging uh, um, of uh, optic, elevated optic nerves, the presence of optic disc drusen. And I really think this is where the answer lies in terms of confirming the presence of drusen. Of course, just because you have drusen doesn't mean you can't develop papilledema. Drusen are exceedingly common, and papilledema does not distinguish patients with and without drusen. Therefore, the possibility of both exists. Uh, I point this paper out because, to the best of my knowledge, it is not correct. Particularly, this uh, boot sign of the outer nuclear layer wrapping around uh, something next to the disc here. It turns out that this is seen both in papilledema and pseudopapilledema. These are not drusen, uh, and you should not use this paper or the boot sign, uh, as confirmed by Byron Lamb and his group at uh, um, Baskin Palmer, in distinguishing papilledema and pseudopapilledema. There have been uh, several different uh, really good papers looking at the various characteristics of optic distrusion on enhanced depth uh, imaging. Uh, this paper is the best. It's a uh, harder to read the reference here, but it's in uh, the Journal of Neuroophthalmology in the last couple of years. And uh, a group really got together and characterized the various EDI features of optic distrusion. Um, I'll point this out. My face is blocking it on the video, but um, this was an example demonstrating how the optic distrusion can also cause that peripapillary uh, retinal mass-like lesion that uh, is capable of creating the boot sign on an OCT in both drusen and in papilledema. So don't use that boot sign as your distinguisher. What you should use, um, again, um, <clears throat> of course, is history, and I'll come back to that to a minute. But you can clearly identify these hypoechoic areas, which are not the shadows of vessels, and occasionally also get these microcalcifications on the surface in other areas that are typical of optic distrusion. So as you increase your experience in looking at these enhanced depth images, you can go back to this paper. Again, just be careful to distinguish the shadows of vessels versus clearly isolated lesions, all these asterisks, if you will, or drusen, 
Here's that uh, boot sign again, which is uh, clearly present in both uh, papilledema and pseudopapilledema and can't be used. And of course, if you get lucky, uh, you'll have it on autofluorescence also. Even more important, as uh, demonstrated in the index case, is the presence of the bowing forward of the, or flattening of the back of the eye associated with bowing forward of Brooks membrane in patients uh, with papilledema as demonstrated in this particular case. And of course, again, they're shadowing from vessels here and changes on the surface, uh, but <clears throat> none of those uh, hypochoic areas with rims of uh, bead-like calcification, typical of Drusen. Um, <clears throat> and uh, here's a patient again, uh, this is from the IHCT papers by Mark Coopersmith uh, that clearly show that difference of where you'd expect Brooks to be based on uh, extending the line and then noticing uh, the bowing forward. Uh, and here's an example of a patient much like ours who was presented with papilledema and then was successfully treated. And you can see uh, significant bowing back or resolution uh, of the disc swelling. Uh, here's another example again. Um, um, not sure, except of course, because I know in retrospect that you know if this patient went to his optometrist and had no complaints, you know, would you potentially want to make this into Drusen with little visual fields? Are you convinced that based on some blurring around the vessels that this must be papilledema? Certainly, um, the OCT was very helpful here again, demonstrating the bowing forward of a Brooks membrane, typical of patients with papilledema, secondary to pressure in the optic nerve sheet. Uh, here's another uh, patient. I think I don't think there's anyone who would look at that disc beyond the anomalous vessels and say, oh, of course that's pseudopapilledema. There's no way that's papilledema. This is certainly a tough one. When you pair it with this disc, you kind of get the sense of uh, you know siblings that are misbehaved and have something of like each other. This more obvious than this one. But what's ob <clears throat> more obvious here again, and I also know this because these discs have looked the same for five years. This patient has bowing backwards of Bo's mem Bo, uh, Brooks membrane towards the optic nerve sheath. Again, typical of a normal appearance or a normal relationship between uh, Brooks um, and the sclera in a patient who has normal intracranial pressure. I put this example in the middle, um, which is an example of papilledema, to highlight the difference between this trajectory and this trajectory. This is papilledema, this is pseudopapilledema, excuse me, and this is papilledema with the bowing forward of a Brooks membrane. And then remember, somewhat underutilized and underappreciated and ultimately critically important in patients who have Drusen and then have a reason to develop papilledema is the use of fluorescent angiography, which generally will only show uh, uh, perhaps some staining in the setting of um, optic disc Drusen, but would show frank leakage uh, with, in patients who have elevated intracranial pressure. But in fact, uh, the best way to distinguish papilledema and pseudopapilledema is to simply take a history. Um, if you put um, headaches and transient visual obscurations uh, along with post-cell tinnitus and just ask about any of these other symptoms, there is almost no patients, and this is not obviously a 100% rule, there are almost no patients that don't have symptoms associated with their papilledema. Now, we all see one or two a year that uh, presented for a routine uh, ophthalmologic or optometric exam and optic disc elevation was noted and they have a low grade form of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. But generally taking a history and noting the recognizing the prevalence of these many other symptoms will help to identify patients with papilledema. Obviously the presence of headaches and pseudopapilledema uh, becomes tricky if you get too vested in that and then you have to result on, uh, resort to imaging and other things. Um, OCT alone cannot be used to follow papilledema patients. There are several good studies that show uh, on FOS 3D reconstructions of swollen optic nerves, which clearly uh, can show the trajectory of both developing of swelling and resolution of swelling. Uh, unfortunately, remember that the resolution of swelling is also associated with death of axons. Uh, here's resolution of swelling associated with successful treatment with Diamox in IH patients. But in the end, some measure of visual function has to be your guide as to whether papilledema is getting better because pressure is normalizing, or is it getting better because uh, optic nerves are dying. So we can use these volumetric measurements in a healthy, in a patient who is being treated, is feeling better, seeing better, uh, the disc is getting less swollen. Certainly OCT will show you that. 
uh, obviously, as will ophthalmoscopic, ophthalmoscopic examination. Uh, so while this is uh, a good thing to measure, if you want to have something objective to report and to test your therapy, be careful in using it alone and distinguishing a successful treatment and a, pap and a, pseudo and a papilledema patient who's well on their way to recovery. <clears throat> Here's a, a nice summary chart from uh, Matt Thurtell's book on uh, distinguishing papilledema and pseudopapilledema. Uh, I find that transient visual obscurations are almost never seen in patients with basic pseudopapilledema, really chunky discs with lots of drus and occasionally. But if a patient is really describing the new onset in particular of transient visual obscurations, remember these are one, two, three, four second little gray outs or puffs of gray smoke in vision associated with position change. Um, that's a big uh, leaning towards papilledema. Obviously, visual field loss, which is present in Drusen patients uh, after years. Um, remember that venous pop, uh, pulsations are often hard to see in patients with pseudopapilledema because you need that the big cup and the edge of the cup to see the venous pulsations. OCT video can occasionally help you see venous pulsations. Um, they Generally, if they are present, you can be pretty confident that the pressure in the optic nerve sheath does not exceed the venous pressure. Uh, this is probably my favorite. You know, pseudopapilledema patients, they simply don't change. So if you get to a point where you can't tell, take a picture, take an OCT, see the patient back in a month. Obscuration of vessels, classically not present with pseudopapilledema. Abno anomalous branching, again, all Drusen patients, almost all of them have a funny appearance of their vessels with early uh, bifurcations and trifurcations. Remember that papilledema occasionally causes hemorrhages in the nerve fiber layer, and in uh, pseudopapilledema, they are subretinal. Um, the cup is preserved until late in patients with papilledema, and like an example I showed of that grade three to four kind of papilledema who had a lot of cotton wool spots, but the, the cup was still preserved. It's usually never a cup in a patient with pseudopapilledema. Uh, retinal folds, uh, particularly uh, those... Um, Peyton's lines and the circumferential folds that uh, were shown on those OCT images are often part of papilledema. Uh, and again, fluorescein leakage uh, is generally present when the disc is swollen uh, in patients with papilledema. Um, <clears throat> and um, with that, um, remember that in the end, the most important thing to me is detecting a history and a setting uh, that is compatible with papilledema. Uh, so uh, in summary and finally to conclude, uh, OCT characteristics of pseudopapilledema and papilledema are, are well-defined, but remember, unfortunately, those the patients in whom you'd really like to know, is this papilledema or pseudopapilledema, there are two things working against us ever having a gold standard. One is that patients with pseudopapilledema can get papilledema, or those with optic distrusion can get papilledema, and the endpoint or the gold standard of when the disc is swollen because of high elevated intracranial pressure is dependent on a measurement which is notoriously inaccurate, not done by the same person. Everyone does it differently, and that's the opening pressure on spinal tap. So there's gonna to have to be a fair amount of ambiguity here in which you count on the clinical exam and comparison of photographs uh, for the detection of papilledema uh, uh, at interval visits. OCT will never replace the decision-making in patients with IIH in terms of needing to advance therapy uh, and include surgical intervention. It will always be visual fields and or perhaps the ganglion cell layer measurement uh, can be used here. But I think if that's the case, um, that's almost always gonna be irreversible, whereas visual field changes may suggest early dysfunction and be reversible. Um, remember to take a history um, because asymptomatic papilledema is very rare. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, worst case scenario, the patient shows up, you're not sure, you get your visual fields, they're not losing vision, you check your MRI scan to make sure they don't have a brain tumor, and then you hold off on uh, more extensive workup or lumbar puncture, simply take a picture in OCT and see the patient back. Papilledema changes almost always month to month, uh, and uh, almost uh, no change in pseudopapilledema uh, from visit to visit at one month. So I hope that was a... Um, 70 minute tour through um, the way I think about imaging in these uh, very common uh, optic neuropathies, in particular how the OCT can really help in the detection of uh, optic neuritis and our understanding of optic neuritis and multiple sclerosis. And um, I, I think it's unfortunate that ophthalmologists haven't been 
more involved in helping care for multiple sclerosis patients. There's obviously lots of other information, and it's, it's a perfect place for a neuro-ophthalmologist or an ophthalm ophthalmologist who's interested in OCT and or um, optic nerve disorders to participate in decision-making. And, and papilledema, it's, 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 they're interesting discs to look at, and we're going to get better and better understanding of OCT, uh, but don't become too dependent on it and, and depend on ophthalmoscopy and visual fields in facilitating your decision-making concerning a more aggressive treatments. So, Dr. Gendy, thank you very much for having me uh, to your uh, Facebook ophthalmology extravaganza. I enjoyed doing it. I hope that uh, the Ramadan celebration uh, resonates uh, with all the things that uh, you need to be grateful for and to move forward for, and it was my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for a very interesting and very informative lecture. It was amazing. Uh, let's uh, let's see if we can take some questions, if you have time for that. Like, let's see sure. a couple of questions. If anybody wants to ask something, can you raise your hand, please? Uh, okay, we have a couple of raised hands. Dr. Jacob. Uh, hello, could you tell us once more about the OCT findings in patients with optic neuritis about the ganglion cell? Um, not, I'm not exactly sure um, what question you're asking, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll talk about a couple of things as it relates to the ganglion cell layer and optic neuritis. Again, um, thinning of the ganglion cell layer is certainly going to correlate with symptoms that a patient has that aren't detected otherwise with our testing. So someone may have some thinning of the ganglion cell layer, having had occult optic neuritis or recovered from optic neuritis, and still have good color vision, uh, normal visual fields, and seemingly test to be normal, but have both the GCL and, and, and probably more sensitive the nerve fiber layer as an indication that they have taken a hit and or have had another lesion in time or place to add to the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Okay, now can we take uh, Dr. Caroline Tofi? Um, hello, sir. Uh, thank you for the uh, great lecture. Uh, I just have a couple of questions. Uh, in papilledema, uh, you've mentioned the trickling of fluid under the macula. Uh, do we see this without the presence of an optic pit? And my second question is, uh, is there any role for pulse steroid in papilledema? Uh, excellent question. So uh, yes, you definitely can see subretinal fluid in any patient with papilledema. Does not have to have an optic pit to set that up. It just uh, it's mostly intraretinal, but it also can be subretinal fluid that sort of just leaks off of chronically swollen discs of any type. Uh, so uh, for sure. And um, if I were going to if a, pre, if a patient presented to me with severe visual field loss in the setting of a presumed diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, I would definitely give them pulse steroids on their way to getting either a shunt or a fenestration. It would never be part of a try steroids for a week and see what happens, uh, but it might be a reasonable temporizing a, uh, uh, agent while you're on your way to definitive surgical treatment. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Carla. Uh, Dr. Alia. Ah, Dr. Alia. Uh, ah, how are you? <laughs> Good, how are you? It's a pleasure seeing you again. Ah, thanks for coming. Yeah. Dr. Alia was my fellow. Okay. <laughs> so I have a question here in Egypt. They depend so much on VEP for uh, like diagnosing demyelinating optic neuritis. So do you think it has a role? Um, so it's a good question, and it's a loaded question, and uh, as you uh, saw in the RENEW study for the anti-lingo antibody um, treatment, VEP was uh, considered sort of one of the gold standard outcomes of the treatment. There is no doubt that uh, VEP is uniquely abnormal in patients with optic neuritis compared to other optic neuropathies, because not only does it reduce amplitude, but it also reduces latency, and latency is driven by lack of myelin. Uh, so in many ways, the VEP is a very effective way of identifying increased latency and an optic neuropathy consistent with optic neuritis. Uh, 
as ophthalmologists, we don't need the EPs to diagnose optic neuritis because we're able to identify it based on the dysfunction we're able to detect. Um, it sort of is the neurologist's sort of poor man's way of diagnosing uh, optic neuritis and of course, unfortunately, is not a, not a perfect test in terms of getting reliable results and, and patients not giving you uh, their best cooperation. So you have to be careful with false positives. But I think in conjunction with MRI, OCT, um, and really well done VEPs, that they will become, they are, as is low contrast acuity, important part of most trials for treatment of multiple sclerosis. Uh, but don't, I, you know, the, the real surrogate here is that the neurologist is going to very comfortable doing VEPs and they're going to use that to make a diagnosis of optic neuritis or anterior visual pathway involvement. And it is uh, too, it's too nonspecific to be considered in isolation for this diagnosis. Uh, I have another question, if you may allow me. So after a patient comes with like an idiopathic optic neuritis and there are no plaques uh, uh, on the MRI and they recovered, how often do you see them for follow-up? If you, if you ever see them just to, for like incidence of um, MS on the long term? Yeah, so um, again, that, that, would, that depends on my um, you know, access to that patient and a neurologist, but I think if you're gonna be the person following someone like that, you probably would see them again at six months, um, and uh, here that might be a place where you do an OCT to show that the nerve fiber layer is not changing. I think a person like that, if it were my sister or brother, I would want them to have an MRI scan and an MRI scan of their uh, spine at six months, uh, and maybe it again at 18 months. I, I really think that almost every patient that has optic neuritis, uh, you know, certainly 80% of them um, uh, in the setting of one white matter lesion are going to get multiple sclerosis. So it'd be a tricky patient for you to follow on your own. On the other hand, we did it for 30 years of just saying, oh, you know, this is a, uh, just, it's like MS, but as long as you don't get anything else, have a yeah. nice and I'll see you, right? So um, I, it, there is enough evidence now that uh, multiple sclerosis can be detected uh, in a pre-symptomatic phase based on all these new MRI scan. And if you have access to that, uh, then I think that patient, just like somebody with the BRCA gene who gets screened for breast cancer, even though they don't have it, um, it this is a reasonable place to do screening with MRI scans over a period of years, uh, whether that's you or neurologist is sort of practice choice. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. It's great to hear your voice. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Alia. Uh, now, Dr. Fairuz. Uh, hello, sir. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, interesting talk. Uh, my question is about uh, IIH in children. How often do you see them and uh, about the management? <clears throat> Great question. Um, so IH in children um, is really broken down into two categories, the prepubescent and the postpubescent uh, person. So in after age 13 or 14 or postpuberty, then it's very similar to the adult disease. Um, it correlates clearly with weight gain and obesity. And uh, in my experience, uh, generally a, a fairly benign course once weight is identified as the risk factor and that uh, intervention occurs. That's also a high risk group for tetracyclines and other acne medications. So make sure you keep that in mind in a teenager. Then there's a second group of uh, what's called idiopathic intracranial hypertension in uh, toddlers and uh, school age children. And that has absolutely no correlation with uh, obesity or weight gain. Uh, those patients can be difficult to monitor and to measure uh, and um, uh, represent a small minority, but a difficult group to, uh, to take care of. So just because you're seeing a, a thin kid, a thin child who has uh, swollen optic nerves doesn't mean you have to uh, exclude IH as a potential diagnosis. Obviously, the potential for uh, MRI lesions to be present in that group is much higher. So you definitely want to get careful neuroimaging on those patients. And about the treatment, they are the same as the management, yes. treatment as uh, adults? 
Yep, same treatment, um, Dimox, uh, and you know, with appropriate dosing per kilogram and um, surgery if necessary. And I, I, I think I, in 30 years, maybe know about four or five children that ended up with optic nerve sheath fenestrations. Most of them end up with shunting procedures um, just because of the chance to treat definitively. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Dr. Hussain Abdul Hamid. Thank you, Doctor. Hello. Yes. Hello. I can hear uh, thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for your presentation. My question about OC OCT angio and rule it in optic neuritis, ischemic, ischemic optic ne uh, neuritis, and babyledema. OCT angio. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that's to be determined. You know, there's some uh, early papers out that have identified increased uh, vascular. Uh, density <clears throat> in patients with any type of disc swelling in the small capillaries. I uh, recently completed a study kind of looking at the other optic nerve of patients who have ischemic optic neuropathy to see if we can identify a vascular abnormality in those patients that put them at risk for ischemic optic neuropathy. But in the end, um, kind of just the way when a disc atrophies, the vessel diameter goes down, when it's swollen, uh, the the average uh, diameter and flow through vessels increases a bit, but in my experience, does not yet have a diagnostic role in managing these patients. And I would not, outside of ischemic optic neuropathy, think it's going to contribute to our understanding of the pathogenesis of these patients' conditions. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor Hassan. Uh, Doctor uh, Ahmed, Doctor Ahmed Nasif. Ah yes. Uh, 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 good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, this rather interesting uh, presentation. My question is about the cases that come presenting as an optic neuritis and you do the antibody tests, uh, antimog is negative, aquaporin 4 is negative. We give the steroid treatment like the ONTT uh, regimen and they get worse and uh, there's, there's no definite diagnosis here. I don't know when to go for plasmapheresis. So how long do you wait and what do you do with such cases? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think the devil's going to be in the details on something like that in terms of, you know, what the disc looks like, what the MRI scan look like. I, you know, to, to, there, are, there are definitely going to be patients, um, for instance, on the NMO spectrum that have negative serologies who have bad vision loss and no matter what you do they don't get better and it's a lost uh, a lost cause right from the start uh, i do think you have to progress uh, through the steroids the plasmapheresis and the ivig at the very least obviously if you're five or six weeks into it uh, the chance that you're going to get the patient better are remote uh, but in that case you're just trying to get whatever's happening to stop to prevent them the other eye getting worse for more progression, but there are rare cases in which you do not have a specific diagnosis in which you're not able to uh, successfully treat them. Again, I would urge you to, to be thoughtful about your differential diagnosis there to make sure that you've excluded you know, syphilis, all the other obvious things that uh, lymphoma that might creep, creep into the differential diagnosis of an atypical optic neuritis, so meningiomas, things like that. So when would you uh, commence with plasma pieces? I mean, how long would you wait to decide it? Uh, yeah, I, I think within days of not getting better on steroids, we would add plasma pieces in our hospital uh, hospitalized patient with vision loss from an NMO or MOG-like presentation. Because right. if you go beyond if you go beyond days, it's game over. Oh, so we wait for say one week. Yeah. I mean, should yeah. wait one, one week. week of no improvement on IV steroids with severe vision loss. That would uh, those patients would get more aggressive treatment. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet. You. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Dr. Sh Shafa. Shaf Shafa. Shafa Frihi. Yes. Um. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, thank yes. you so much for this talk. I actually have two questions. Uh, the first question is, how do you approach pediatric patients with optic neuritis? I know it's a different disease entity, so how do you approach pediatric patients specifically? This is the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, 
um, in children, how do you differentiate between uh, true uh, optic nerve head swelling and uh, drusens? I know that drusens in children are uh, less calcified, they're more buried. So what do you rely on in your clinical testing? Thank you, Amy. Um, <clears throat> so uh, optic neuritis in children is a very different entity. There's a very high prevalence of MOG, so every child with optic neuritis needs to be tested for MOG antibodies. Uh, I would recommend that any child who presents uh, with uh, optic neuritis that's bilateral, which it often is, and or with severe vision loss, get intravenous steroids regardless of antibody status right from the start, uh, and uh, also an MRI scan. Remember, there's a subset of acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or ADEM, uh, in which patients uh, have a very uh, active uh, acute white matter inflammation that it generally has a good prognosis and is generally uh, very, uh, very successfully treated with um, uh, intravenous steroids. So MOG and steroids are the, the two things that I do early and quickly in patients with children. And then for drusen in, in, in children, don't see a lot of children with drusen, to be honest with you, but in my world, uh, as long as you can't be sure that it isn't papilledema, then the child gets uh, an MRI scan. And at the same token, a relatively low risk for vision loss in mildly swollen optic nerves in children who have good reserves. So that's a patient who I think it's most likely gonna be drusen. I will hold off on the LP, take a picture, maybe see if I can get an OCT. Obviously, it'll depend on the size of the, the person and their ability to cooperate. Uh, but th these are the usual challenges of pediatric patients, uh, and you may end up with just a photograph and your instincts in terms of their other symptoms, but imaging both the brain to be sure, and then uh, the optic nerve and following them would be my approach. Okay, last uh, question. One more question, yeah. Yeah, last question from uh, Rana. Yes. Um, yes, hello, Dr. Volpe. Thank you very much for the awesome lecture. Uh, my question is not related to the two topics that we discussed. Actually, it's related to the role of uh, systemic or actually periocular steroids in cases of non-arthritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, especially that most of these patients are usually of old age and they have multiple uh, cardiovascular risk factors such as diabetes and hypertension. Um, so, I mean, that's, a, that's an important question that uh, certainly has no right answer. So there have been many, many different looks at uh, steroids, either oral or periocularly for the management of ischemic optic neuropathy. And uh, there is um, no trial that's ever shown it has worked and uh, no reason not to try it if it's a desperate patient who's getting worse in front of your eyes. Uh, so it, it would be um, less than one in 10 patients that I would treat with steroids uh, in the setting of non-ortic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy be somebody who's getting worse uh, as opposed to better in the first two or three weeks, and it would be a completely non-evidence-based decision. Um, as you know, Dr. Hayray feels strongly about uh, benefit from steroids. It's not hard to imagine why steroids might help for secondary axonal damage in the setting of the swelling caused by the ischemia, uh, but unfortunately, that jury will it'll still be out, and I don't know that it will be ever, ever be answered. I think we'll have another treatment for ischemic optic neuropathy before we get back to figuring out whether steroids are helpful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That uh, concludes our questions. And, uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Dr. Gundy. Can you hear me now? Uh, barely, but. Uh, okay, let's try another one. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, this, is, this was the last question. Uh, thank you very much for a lovely uh, uh, lecture and for answering all the questions. Uh, it was an honor having you with us. And uh, hopefully uh, uh, we can have you for another lecture soon, inshallah. Anytime, just reach out. I was glad to meet you all. Good luck and stay safe amidst the pandemic. Take good care of your patients and each other. And uh, best for Ramadan and its celebration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, now this meeting has ended and we'll see you again soon. We'll announce for the next lecture. Inshallah, uh, this, this is the last lecture in Ramadan. We'll see you after the Eid. Goodbye, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Nicholas. And uh, see you uh, soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.